this press conference uh, is the um, uh, current uh, state of affairs uh, this morning's session, uh, the introductions from uh, our two distinguished guests. So uh, we leave the floor open. Daniel, you will direct the questions. Yeah, Tuggle McTuggle, I see. David McTuggle from the Association for Press Reporting. Um, I wanted to uh, ask for a since she has visited Europe as being the true celebration of your life and your cause and your freedom, but could you return to Myanmar and go about the business of practical politics? What steps have you taken to address the democratic imbalances of the 2008 constitution? Not just ideals or hopes, but concrete measures that your party as political opposition has to take to bring about meaningful change. First of all, I, I don't think of this journey as a celebration of my life. I think of it as a celebration of all those people who have supported the movement of democracy in Burma, because it's they who have made it possible for me to come out on this journey. But uh, practical steps towards amendments to the Constitution, I've always said, are uh, linked to negotiations with the army. Because, as you all probably know, I don't know if you know, that in order to amend this constitution, we need more than 75% of the assembly to vote uh, for amendments. And 25% of the assembly are representatives of the army. So even assuming that we get all uh, the civilian representatives, which of course uh, is not very likely because the great majority of them are from the USDT, uh, to vote for an amendment, we, we would still need at least one army representative, representative to vote for amendment. So we have to work together with the army. I've been very open about it. We want to work together with the army. We don't want to be in conflict with them. We want to achieve a consensus. We want them to understand that what we are doing is uh, starting a process that will be better for the whole country that will include the military as well. In that case, well, Tom Christiansen. Madam, let me see you as the mother of nation. You are a leader of a opposition party. How will you combine those two roles? I'm not in opposition to the people. <laughs> so I think it's perfectly all right for the people to see me as a mother if they wish to, although uh, I'm not quite sure that I'm not whether, uh, sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to be regarded as, as a mother because I don't quite know what they expect from me as a mother. <laughs> but if they, what they expect is to serve them, is to do what would be good for them, then I'm perfectly prepared to play the role of mother. But they must also understand that I'm a politician and I've always said to them that I will make them more pro no promises which I cannot be sure of keeping. So the only promise I've ever made to them is that I will try my best. And this promise I will keep. I will try my best. But uh, whether or not my best is good enough for them, time only will tell. I hope it will be good enough. Thank you. Frank Seller, AFP. Uh, the recent changes in your country have been uh, stunning, uh, although, um, although you caution that you're only at the beginning of the road. Um, now, there have been many reasons uh, you complained of sanctions, poverty, for why these changes came about. But from your talks with the president, with the president and from your gut feeling, what, what is the crucial clinch factor that, that saw the generals change direction? I don't think you can talk of just one factor. I think uh, sanctions and uh, the general uh, reactions of the interna international community have a lot to do with it. And uh, the other reason is, some is that whether you like it or not, you have to recognize that Burma is not doing well. And I think uh, the present government recognized that. In fact, I think even the previous uh, government recognized that, that our country was not doing well. Our people were getting poorer, they were getting uh, uh, less well-educated, their health was worse. I understand that in most countries, uh, the new generation is usually better educated than the older one. This is not the case in Burma. We find that in our country, the younger people are less well-educated than uh, people of my age group. So I think they became aware of the fact that there were too many problems and that they were falling behind even their neighbors in our region. What was 
Ziehe ich like, uh, I like the song. He's about Mali fan. Because, because so am I. I think, are you talking about Walk On? Yes. Well, I like that song because it's very much, uh, it's very close to how I feel. That it's up to you to carry on. It's good if you have supporters. It's good if you have people who are sympathetic and understanding. But in the end, it's your own two legs that have to carry you on. Yeah, I mean, it's so an impertinence in ways to, to write a song about someone that you haven't met, but we all feel we, we knew. And doubly so that I, I, I wrote it, not literally, but uh, from the point of view of, of her husband, Michael. So. I'm, I'm amazed that, uh, that it has, has been taken to her heart and to the hearts of others. It's, uh, you never know. If, it, if the song was shite, uh, y you know, it could have made matters a lot worse. TV2, Toast Offset. Oh, okay. Uh, questions for Bono. Uh, how would you uh, rate of all living persons today how the Well, uh, I was just talking inside about, you know, um, I'm not sure how many people realize that um, Do Aung San Suu Kyi came on the road with you two on our 360 tour. Um, uh, seven million people we played to. She was there every night, um, a digital version. But she's very good live. <laughs> and uh, she made a real connection with our audience, indeed speaking to our audience. Uh, we would leave the stage and leave her. Um, to the audience and telling them that their voices were powerful and that they could be heard all the way to Burma. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there's the, you know, we have the, uh, you know, we have a few people who, who, who would arrive up with a t-shirt with ASSK on uh, and think she was a speed metal band from, from Asia. And, and it's, it's sort of great that in a U2 uh, crowd, not everyone's a political science student. But we had this, you know, we were responding to her call to, to make sure that the, that the people of Burma and political prisoners of Burma would not be forgotten. I can't possibly assess um, what um, this lady will mean to uh, the world. I can tell you what she means to me. Um, and it's really her, her, her nonviolent uh, uh, position that I find so impressive because perhaps I find it hard to fathom. I'm a student of violent, nonviolence because I, I find it very hard um, to, to imagine how you, you can be so. And um, you know, you get the feeling um, with Dorsu that it's not that you know, peace is not the absence of war around us but rather peace is the absence of war within us. And I think it's that sort of position that's unusual in a, in a politician. And I think she will be remembered um, for, that, for that kind of um, spiritual insight, really, as much as the sort of nitty-gritty of her politics, because she's a tough customer, too. Aftenposten, Christopher Enemar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that Dorsey donors and compassion for the noble people on Saturday. Uh, and you said in relation to being at the uh, refugee camp in Thailand, a lot of countries, including Norway, uh, are now shifting their aid efforts from uh, the exile communities to, to within the Burmese borders. How do you see that shift? Is it too early? Uh, especially since we're in Norway with regards to the Norwegian situation. And is it right that the international community to use the name Myanmar instead of Burma? Well, first of all, let me uh, explain the Myanmar Burma part because it's in a way quicker. Uh, the reason why I objected to, uh, to the change of name was not because of the change itself, but because of the way in which it was changed. The uh, State Law and Order Rest uh, Restoration Council, I think it was called, at that time, simply announced one day that the name of the country, the international name of the country, uh, would be changed from Burma to Myanmar without so much as a buy or leave where the people was, were concerned. And this, of course, is, is the ultimate in undemocratic practice, that the people did not even have a right to decide how they were going to be known to the rest of the world. And this is why I keep to Burma. 
because of the way in which it was changed, not because I actually uh, I uh, object to the name Myanmar in itself. Now, with regard to donor fatigue and compassion fatigue, uh, the, what you have mentioned is true that there seems to be more c focus on helping uh, organisations within the country uh, than organisations outside the country. But I think that's a little different from compassion fatigue. Uh, a change of focus. Uh, is not necessarily the result of compassion fatigue, but it could be linked to it. So while I'm not objecting to help for those organizations within the country which will strengthen democratic institutions, I do not think that refugees in particular should be, there are, there are many groups abroad of course, we talk about exile groups in general, but I am of the opinion that refugees in particular should not be forgotten and that uh, the, the donors should continue to do the, the good work that they have been doing. I also mentioned uh, the fact that the Thai government also needs to be helped because host countries <coughs> have responsibilities and problems and difficulties that need to be resolved with the help of the international community. The gentleman in the red ribbon. I'm uh, from the BBC for me, for me to ask to see the BBC starts. It doesn't need to be right to Never, the country never experienced genuine political negotiation of the Lord Taliban. So, one case in the Bureau, the Bureau of Bureau of Time, we can talk about it. How do you think I will be to do to the Taliban down the way to negotiation of the Taliban? We can say to the Taliban. How do you think it's going to be a good one? โอ้ปะมาอุซุงอ่ะรอจวาเนี่ยตะนายุเต็งสิงตุ๋ยดาอ่ะรอเตี้ยวเนี่ยเตี้ยวตุ๋ยปิโรซวยนุ๋ยด
Now, whether it's heard by the uh, the captors uh, in Amnesty's case or the or the, or the, or the captives is, is is open to debate. But I I have a funny feeling that you know mili military dictatorships are you know um, not just about muscle; they're quite vain. Mm -hmm. I think they read their their email and the choruses of boos and hisses that they get. They kind of they kind of take the temperature of how much they're getting away with um, or not. And so the roar of an audience in, whether it's Birmingham, England, or Chicago, or whatever, is heard. And I think that, I think seeing progress in, in Burma is just a great thing to encourage more people to get involved in the, in the political process. I'm starstruck, I think is the word, um, but I'm managing to get over it. I mean, I'm looking, I'm pretending, <coughs> like I'm not. Last question to the gentleman, last second one. Hi, uh, National Public Radio of the U.S. Um, some people would dispute your characterization that the root of the Rohingya problem is law enforcement's inefficiency or corruption among the immigration people. Some say the root of the problem might be your government's policy to deny citizenship to the Rohingya. Now, as leader of the opposition, people hope you will provide a clear set of alternatives to the government policy uh, and speak up for the uprooted of the earth, as you put it so eloquently on Saturday. So, are the Rohingya citizens of your country, or are they not? Thank you. I spoke about rule of law, and rule of law covers rules of citizenship as well. And this is what I mean by saying that the root of the problem is lack of rule of law. We are not certain exactly what the requirements of citizenship laws are. I will mention one particular case uh, of a, one of our, um, ma our candidates for the last by-elections who was disqualified because in accordance with the uh, election regulations, all candidates have to be born of nationals. Both parents must be nationals. Now this candidate of ours, his parents were both, both of them were Burmese nationals when he was born. But later, his father took up another nationality. And on those grounds, he was disqualified uh, as a candidate. So this is what I mean. We're, even with regard to citizenship, we are not clear what the laws really are. And rule of law, if we were very clear as to who are the citizens of the country, under the citizenship laws and who qualify, then there wouldn't be this problem which is always coming up that there's, there's this accusation that, that some people do not belong in Bangladesh or some people do not belong in Burma. Uh, Bangladesh says that they're not ours and Burma says that they're not ours and these poor people get shuffled around. So we have to have rule of law. We have to know what the law is and we have to make sure that it is properly implemented. What should it be? What should it be in regard to their citizenship? Are they or are they not? I do not know because we, when you talk about the Rohingya, we are not quite sure whom you're talking about. As I said, there's a, there's a problem about whom we're referring to. There are some who, who say that those people who claim to be Rohingyas are not the ones who are actually native to Burma, but who have just come over recently from Bangladesh. But on the other hand, Bangladesh says no, they don't want them as refugees because uh, they, they are not native to Bangladesh and they come over from Burma. So how do we sort this out without rule of law, without proper... Uh, immigration processes, without proper policing, without proper implementation of the laws. This is why I said the root of all this is rule of law, going back many decades, not going back just to the crime that has been uh, committed a couple of months ago. Our time is up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.